Thanks for tuning in at Coastal Christian Ocean City. For more information on anything going on here, you can visit our website at ccoceancity.com or check out our app in the App Store or Google Play. Today, Pastor Matthew will be bringing the message. So without further ado, here's Pastor Matthew. So we're going to look at the blessed consequence of the coming of Jesus and what that entails. So I want to give you the bottom line up front. I want to give you the main thread. I want to give you what I want you to take home with you up front. And this is what I want you to get out of everything I'm going to share tonight out of the Word of God, that it is truly at his birth, the birth of Jesus, that God became God with us. And then at his death, he became God for us. And then after his resurrection and his ascension, he became God in us, God with us, God for us, God in us. This was a prophecy, a promise that God spoke through his prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 9, verse 6. He would say, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, before we look at for unto us a child is born, which is God's humanity in Jesus, I want us to consider the government that was upon his shoulders. Of course, this is the economy of heaven. This is the kingdom of God that Jesus would carry out the reign and the rule of God. The government was upon his shoulders, but something else was upon his shoulders. The reason he could carry out the reign and the rule of God is because the cross was upon his shoulders. That which was the responsibility, or should I say the irresponsibility of God's creation that we would reject and rebel against him. And what we deserve, what we should be responsible for is the wages of our sin, which determines death. And Christ was like, no, I'm gonna take that upon my shoulders. I'm gonna bear your sin. I'm going to give you my life. And in my life, you will find new life. And his name will be wonderful. It's miracle. That's what the word means. It means he's a miracle worker counselor, which means he is the greatest advisor, but he doesn't stand off in the distance and just give good advice. He's also a mighty and strong God, sovereign. He knows the end from the beginning. He is the everlasting father. He operates, church, look at me, in timelessness. In timelessness, he knows what your tomorrow holds. I'm confident that when we understand this everlasting Father in his sovereignty, that every single day on your calendar and my calendar, he already has planned. I don't know what that should do to you, but some of us are going through some hardships, some trials, some tragedies, and I want to encourage you to see God's sovereignty that he saw that day before you were born, and he's prepared peace for you to have as you navigate the hardships of life everlasting father and the prince of peace. In these five descriptions, characteristics of God, we see his nature. For unto us a child is born. Why would a child have to be born? Well, it's very simple. A child was born so that we could be born again. That's it. And here in this fractured and fallen world, everyone and everything is broken. You're broken, I'm broken, creation's broken, relationships are broken, from Adam and Eve all the way into the days of you and me, fractured, fallen, broken. And God said, I see you in your brokenness. I'm going to put a product recall out upon creation. You know what a product recall is, right? It's when a manufacturer puts out a recall because a product has a defect. And God says, I see you in your brokenness. I'm going to put a product recall out on all creation. And in Christ, he would recall us to himself. And the call has gone out from eternity to enter into your life individually, that you would respond to a calling to be reconciled back to God. You know, as ministers, as Christians, those that wear the name of Christ, Our calling is one and the same. 
It says, God in Christ reconciled the world back to himself. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. God in Christ recalled, reconciled the world back to himself. And then he gave us or committed to us, guess what? The ministry of reconciliation. It's the gospel. It's when I not only live out, but I share the gospel, the good news, that God wants to reconcile all that is broken back to himself. And then verse 20 is this. Now then... As ambassadors for Christ. And then Paul would write, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you. Paul saying, as though God himself was communicating through me right here, right now, pleading with all creation, imploring, which means begging. Should we not beg those that are lost, who are destined to go to hell? Should we not implore them? Should we not offer them the hope that we say we have? Should it not move us that not a single person in this sanctuary and in this community and beyond is guaranteed to wake up and see tomorrow? Yet we haphazardly and complacently take this good news, this gospel, and we don't share it. We have the cure to the soul sickness. And Paul's like, we're ambassadors. God has put out a product recall, and he's using you to remind people that they can be reconciled to God. I know there are millions of excuses for people not to trust God. We look out in a broken and fractured world, and we use excuses from natural disasters to family tragedies and say, well, if there is a good God, then why is this happening? Again, we need to be equipped to understand that it's a fractured and fallen, and in a fractured and fallen world, things are going to continue to fall. But this is what we need to understand, that whether somebody wants to use an excuse, an indictment against God, that's why I don't really trust him, that's that's why I'm not going to give my life to him, even the excuses that I'll give them, I was born this way. I was born this way, okay, whether it's sexual orientation, addiction, an angry disposition. Oh, this is part of my family of origin. This is just the way I am. You ever heard those excuses? Okay, you can have that. You were born this way, and that's why you need to be born again. That's why we need to be born again. Yeah, I was born this way, jacked up, messed up, sinful. And that's why the Bible says you need to be born again. Again, And to be born again is for Christ to take the fracture in your soul and mend it with his love. It's for him to take the fallen and sinful nature of humanity and redeem it by the blood of his son, Jesus. And let me just clue us in on this redemptive plan that God put in order. And it wasn't a plan B. It wasn't, oops, Adam and Eve fell. It wasn't a plan B. It was God's plan from eternity. And as it was already written that the lamb would be slain before the foundations of the world, these prophecies written 700 years before Jesus would even come, prophecies such as Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This has the essence of what we call Christmas. The virgin birth, she would give birth to a son. They should call him Jesus. His name means the Lord saves. His descriptive name, Emmanuel, means God with us. This was God telling his people, the nation of Israel, when they were at odds with one another. Literally, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were at odds. In fact, the northern kingdom, Israel, as they were called, they made an alliance with Syria, and they were going to war against Assyria. So here's the southern kingdom, Judah, and they're being pulled into that alliance, but they didn't want to go with them, so they decided to go with Assyria. And in the midst of vulnerability and confusion, in the midst of a country that was completely divided... Where are you, God? He goes, oh, you want a sign of where I'm at? The virgin is going to conceive, and she's going to bear a son, and he shall be called Emmanuel. See, God said, I'm not just going to tell you I'm with you. 
I'm going to show you I am with you. And it didn't just happen like that. You see, 700 years later, in God's timing, is when this prophecy was fulfilled. This is what Matthew the disciple would pull from. In Matthew 1.23, he says the same thing. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Joseph, your wife Mary, the child within her, that is the doing of the Holy Spirit. Mary, this child within you, he will be called Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. It says all of this was said to be fulfilled as the prophecy from Isaiah, as Matthew would pen it, that this God that we serve tonight through Jesus Christ, his son, he stepped out of time. He stepped into time to change time for all time. And that is why you can trust him with your Time. Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus steps into his ministry and he says, the time is fulfilled. Now, that is a very hefty statement from Jesus. When he said the time is fulfilled, he said that all of time, all of history is fulfilled in my arrival. At a certain place in human history, when Jesus stepped onto the scene, he said, all that is in history was waiting for this moment. It is all about me. And he tells us what he wants us to do. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Literally, when Jesus was born and as he lived and eventually died and rose again, we change the entire way that we measure time based on Jesus Christ's life. So even those that don't believe in him being God, they can't get around the fact that we measure time, which is now going down, and we call it BC, before Christ, and when he showed up, it's now going up, and we call it AD, which is the year of our Lord. And I wanna take that and go, wow, that was me. Me before Christ, I was going down and I was on my way to hell. And then Jesus interrupted, Jesus initiated, and now in the year of the Lord, my time is on its way up. And whether I go to him or he comes to me, God with us. But what did it take? I'm going to spend way more time this Sunday looking at God with us. But as we look at it from one angle, what did it take God to be with us? Well, in a sentence, what he did, he chose to feel us before he would eventually fix us. He could have sent a message that would have healed us. Yet he decided to actually enter into humanity. He wrapped himself in flesh, and then he unwrapped himself in death all to be able to empathize with his creation. Hebrews chapter four, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Are, are you seeing this? The God we serve, he can relate to you. He knows what you're going through. There's not a single emotion that you will ever have, not a single experience that you will brush up against that Jesus did not feel. I dare even say that he, God, knows what it's like to lose a child. I speak from experience watching my mother and father navigate the loss of a child. Don't know if there's anything greater in crisis in the soul than a parent burying a child. And even in navigating such grief and such pain and turning to God and saying, how could you? Where were you? We still serve a God who goes, I know what that feels like. I gave up my child. I know there might not be an answer on this side, but you can trust my heart. 
I am with you. This God we serve in Jesus Christ can feel what you feel. In fact, he chose to touch the hearts of sinners, yet sin never touched his heart. Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, an amazing account. It says, And Jesus came down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him, and behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, context, leprosy or a leper in this economy, they were excommunicated. Didn't matter who they were, where they were from. The moment that leprosy was spotted on them, it was a skin disease. Everybody believed that it was not only infectious, it was contagious. So a leper would actually perhaps be a father who had children, had an occupation, and the moment that something showed up on his skin and it was identified, he was excommunicated from everything he ever knew. Do you understand? He is taken out of society, and oh, by the way, the leprosy gets worse. They would wrap them in cloths. They looked like beggars. They weren't allowed to mingle. No human interaction. No human affection. Could not return to touch his wife, to hug his children. He's on the outskirts of the village. And when he shows up, he has to announce, unclean, unclean. Do you understand what that would feel like? I dare not say I do, but there's a piece of paper that when I show up in certain environments, it says, felon, felon. My wife and I, we went across international lines while everybody else was going through a certain metal detector and getting their stamp. I was called out and put in a little room, given some extra care. But there's shame there that exists. I only try to bring that up to let you understand that when somebody was marked as a leper, to shame, marginalized, cast out, and this man, whatever he heard about Jesus, whatever he knew, he decided to push through any barriers. He didn't care what people thought. Even as he came to Jesus' feet and fell and worshipped In that moment, he is violating every single law that was involving a leper. And yet watch what happens here in verse 3. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him. See, for Jesus to touch him was for Jesus to be unclean himself. Now, I looked up the word touch. It wasn't just a touch by brushing or a touch by feeling. When the word touched is mentioned here, It is comparable to not a spark coming off a flyer or fire and hitting your shirt. What happens when a spark comes off a campfire and it hits your shirt and it goes out? This word touch is more related to a flame coming off that fire. Jesus didn't just brush him. Jesus grabbed him. Jesus went all in to show him he loved him. So while everybody else showed up with eyes that were loathing, this God with us showed up and he had eyes that were compassionate. And he reached out and he touched the untouchable. In scriptures, leprosy is symbolic of sin. That we are all leprous spiritually. And when the Lord should have left us, he decided to feel us so he could eventually fix us. This is the God we serve. God with us. The other part of this prophecy from Isaiah verse 9, or excuse me, chapter 9, verse 6 says, for unto us a son is given. Notice, I like this, unto us a child is born, that's his humanity, unto us a son is given, this is his divinity. This verse right here talks about fully man and fully God. Jesus is truly man and truly God. This verse right here, when I see unto us a son is given, I'm reminded of John 3, 16. So I go from the Old Testament, unto us a son is given. Where else is that type of language used? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. Gave us who? His only begotten son. His one of a kind and unique son. He loved the world, broken and fallen creation so much that he wasn't going to just send a message. He was going to send himself in his son 
that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But wait, why? Why did you send us your son? Why did you give us your son? This is it. This is why. A son was given unto death so that you and I can be given over and given unto life. Now, I don't mean to be the Grinch, but even Jesus wanted us to remember his death, not his birth. See, when he gathered his disciples, when the shadow of the cross was looming, he didn't get them together and say, I want you to remember the day I was born. I want you to celebrate my birth. No, he said, take this bread and drink this cup. And when you do that, one is symbolic of my body that's about to be broken and the blood that I'm about to shed. And no doubt they had no clue what that even meant. But after they saw the cross, when they saw the blood, when they saw the body, perhaps the Holy Spirit illuminated that very institution of communion, and it all made sense. And Jesus said, do it in remembrance of me. And then Paul would take that same exact institution in 1 Corinthians 12, and he would say the same thing, do it in remembrance of Jesus. But he also said something interesting. He said, every time you partake, every time you eat and drink, you are proclaiming the Lord's death. So I'm all good with celebrating Christmas as long as you remember that the birth points to his death. Everything about his birth. Now, again, I don't want to go at this idea, this commercial idea of Christmas, but when you study the word of God, you realize some of the things that we are accustomed to that are traditional might not necessarily be biblical. We have an idea of a barn or stable because it says Jesus was laid in a manger. But a manger in their time period would look more like a stone or a hewn out stone or a tablet of stone. It wasn't a wooden manger. It was more like your basement or your garage than your backyard shed. And the reason why Jesus and Mary and Joseph were in this environment, because there was no room for them in the inn. And the inn was perhaps a house which means up on the upper floor where people were invited as guests as they traveled, that's the inn. And by the way, we have no room up here, but you could stay in our garage. And that's where they would bring the animals in, they got that right, when it was cold. And then there would be these these mangers carved out of the stone. And it looked like more of a tomb, like a stone tablet that they laid his dead body on. So even as they laid baby Jesus on the manger, the very environment was pointing to how he would have his body in a tomb. And then these three kings would come. We call them wise men. There weren't three. There could have been 300. We don't know. But they come with gifts. And the gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, interestingly, the gold was symbolic of a king's medal. In the gift, It pointed to the fact that he was the king of kings. And the frankincense was incense that a priest would burn. And in the gift, it points to him being our high priest. And the myrrh was an embalming fluid that they would use when a body was dead. And the myrrh pointed to the fact that he was the prophet who would come and die. See, his birth points to his death. This baby was sent to die. This baby came as the ransom for you and I, 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for many to be testified in due time. Now, I am not telling anybody here tonight anything you don't already know. I'll be shocked and surprised if there was any soul in here tonight or watching online that has not heard the version of the Christmas story. Virgin birth, Jesus Christ came, we sing all of the songs. All of these truths are familiar to us, but that's not what I'm stumbling over. I'm not stumbling over whether or not anybody in this room knows what I'm talking about. I'm stumbling over some of these truths because my question is, when's the last time these truths have humbled us? crushed us, 
under the weight that God divinely condescended, came to earth, actually became part of his creation? Does that not move us? This is a fable, a legend, a cute story. What does this truth do to us? I guess I'll put it in some common current day terms. In light of the current events that actually has our country at odds. So whether you're on the pro or the con side of what's going on in our country, I'm going to take a word that we so easily take sides with, and I say, stop focusing on that. I want to elevate your perspective to something infinitely greater. I need you to understand that the God we serve, he decided to allow us to impeach him so that he could reach us. See, our God is in control. So while people are panicking and they're frantic, they're looking at the state of our union, you need to elevate your perspective a little higher and remind yourself that you serve the king on the throne of the universe. And he allowed you to impeach him just so that he could reach you. See, at his birth, he proved he was God with us. But it doesn't stop there. Because in his death, he became God for us. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. In light of everything that was said, Paul would write, What then shall we say to these things, rhetorically? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he, not with him, also freely give us all things? In other words, how can God... Give us his all, Jesus, and then withhold from you and I the other things that we'll need in life. He who did not spare his own son. Now, if I'm being candid, and I hope you would expect nothing less from me, I am a father to a seven-month-old daughter. And if it was up to my discretion or decision that she would have to be given up or y'all would have to be given up, Y'all got to go. I'm not thinking about it. I don't need to pray about that. I know there are some very good and honorable people up in here. Now, let that sink in. Between y'all and Willow, y'all can say goodbye. But the Bible says, while we were sinners, while we were rejecting him, when we wanted nothing to do with him, Christ died for us. In case you are doubting whether God is for you, that cross is the exclamation point. It should put to rest all doubts. God is for you. He who did not spare his own son, check this out, but delivered him up for us all. And I go, wait a second, I know the gospels. It says God delivered Jesus up. I thought Judas delivered Jesus up. I thought Judas conspired. The Bible says Judas, he went and sold Jesus out. Judas handed over Jesus to the religious elite. And I thought once the religious elite had him, they had a false trial, but in their own hands, they handed him over to who? Pilate. And I thought Pilate said, hey, don't bring him to me. Send him to Herod. I thought they delivered him over to Herod. And I thought Herod, I thought he mocked him and then handed him back to Pilate. Then I thought Pilate washed his hands, that's what the Bible says, and gave them over to the people, the people's opinion and the people's decision. And they, us, we handed them over to the cross. I thought that's what happened. This verse says, God delivered him up for us all. And I see something here. I see that behind every human handing over was the purpose of the Heavenly Father. See, on the day that we call Pentecost, Peter would step to the platform and he would preach a sermon in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. He would say, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by Judah. Judas, no, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. 
That's his sovereignty. All of those handing overs, all of those mishandles, that was the purpose of God. You have taken by lawless hands, that's the responsibility of man. You have crucified and put to death. Are you seeing this? That no matter what you are seeing in your life, that people have mishandled you, you've been handed over to gossip, people have handed you over to opportunities, people have done things to you, against you, and I'm saying you're looking at it from the horizontal, when you go to the vertical, you see that, yeah, you may have been handed over, delivered over, mistreated, but all of it has a purpose in God's economy, all of it. Told you stories about being in prison on the downstairs unit, had about 18 months under my belt where I was jailing, we called it, successfully. I got moved upstairs to a unit that was the worst in the entire prison. All of the gang members were housed on this unit. All of the violence that you would hear about in the institution would ring out from that unit. I got moved up there, long story short, because a supervisor didn't like the way that Jason Williams and I were doing our time. They despised us. They may have been jealous of the peace that we had. I don't know. All I do know is that I got moved upstairs. I got delivered up upstairs unjustly. Didn't do anything wrong. And as I'm penning this message, and I try to think of stories that might be practical and relevant, I go, I got delivered over. And I could have been very resentful and bitter and angry. And then it dawned on me and it crushed me that, yes, when I got moved upstairs, many of you know, I got placed in the bunk bed that eventually the neighbor was John, little John Palladino. Many of you know my testimony. This is a former mob enforcer who came to know the Lord, but that's not what I want to share. See, when I got moved upstairs, an officer who took a liking to me called me to the gate He said, Mayor, what happened? I tried to explain as best as I could, understanding the politics of jail. He said, well, let me tell you what happened from my perspective. He said, we just locked up so-and-so. And And I said, okay. He goes, and he had a shank, which is a knife, and he was going to stick it in you. And the reason I got moved upstairs was completely unrelated to that. And God allowed me to hear that story. How many times in our lives do we not know how God has spared us? How many times have we seen the delivered up or the handed over and got resentful? And all the while, God is saying, my purpose is behind it. You can't see it. No matter how roughly life has handled you, never forget whose hands ultimately hold you. He is with us. He is for us. And now, the greatest truth of all, he is in us. Pre-cross, pre-resurrection, Jesus gets with his disciples and he says in John 14, verses 16 and 17, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then post-resurrection, Jesus shows up and he says this to his disciples in John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I like the connection here with Jesus breathing life into the disciples. It mirrors what took place in the Garden of Eden when God breathed life into Adam and he became a living being. This is the God in us where in Acts chapter 2, whether they actually received the Holy Spirit in that very breathing or not, many Bible scholars say it was just symbolic because it was in Acts chapter 2 when the promise came. He said, when the Spirit falls upon you, that is going to be my presence in you, and then Acts chapter 2 says, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. 
and we read the Old Testament and we look at Moses and we look at David and we look at Daniel and we look at these characters and we say, I wonder what it was like to step up to a sea and have it split. I want that. I want to see that. I wonder what it was like for David to go up against a nine foot nine giant. Wow. David, what was that like? When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Daniel, hey, when you were in that lion's den, man, tell me, like, how did it happen? There were lions there. Were, like, were you scared? And every one of those characters are going to say, are you out of your mind? You're asking me that? What's it like to have God inside of you? What's it like to have the Holy Spirit living in you? What was that like? And I step back and go, wait a second. Do we even know that the Holy Spirit lives in us? Do we know this is what makes us different? Do we know that God in us is that nothing in this world will make us more useful than that? God in you, Charles Spurgeon said, without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are ships without the wind. We are branches without sap. We are like coals without fire. We are useless. Let's consider some of the things that the Holy Spirit provides, the presence of God in us. Fruit. We wouldn't be able to produce fruit. No love, no joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, no self-control, no restraint. We would not bear fruit without the Holy Spirit. We would not have freedom freedom over sin. We wouldn't be navigated by the Holy One of God. We wouldn't be able to overcome our sinful nature. Without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't have faith. No faith. No faith in Christ, which means no hope. We'd be miserable, pitiful people without the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't be reminded of my calling. My calling is to point people to Jesus. Everybody in this room is called to point people to Jesus. All of our calling Point people to Jesus. Without the Holy Spirit, no comfort. I'd go through trials and tribulation and I'd be buried without the comfort of the Holy Spirit. I wonder if any of us are leaning into this resource, this peace. Without the Holy Spirit, no conviction, no passion. I'm up here just going through the motions with no emotion, without the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, no character, no Christ-like character. See, this is the blessed consequence of the coming of Jesus. My prayer is that we would see at his birth, he was God with us. In his death, he became God for us. And then after his resurrection, the hope of glory, Colossians 1, that he would be Christ inside of us. And this would make us most useful in the hands of God. Oh, imagine a people who got a hold of this truth. What community, society would be turned right side up? What family? What child? Let's pray. Father, as we look into your word and we consider the depth of Emmanuel, that you are certainly with us, whether we realize it or not, that you are for us. Your cross is the perfect statement that you love us to death. And the deposit of your Holy Spirit, that you are in us. I pray that we would be filled up to overflow, that we would come back for more, that we would experience your love, that you gave us your son, Jesus, that you decided to feel us, the struggles of humanity, before you would fix us, that you would provide the antidote to our sin-sick souls. Lord, I pray for any families during these holiday seasons, Lord, that are navigating the loss of a loved one, that every holiday 
from Thanksgiving to Christmas to New Year's is like a reminder of what they don't have. But I pray you elevate their perspective, that they would see you as sovereign, that they would receive your peace, and that even through those hardships, Lord God, they would point to you and say, you are good. Bless marriages, families, children tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. As a church, we believe it is our responsibility to connect our community to Christ. So if you found this message helpful, we'd like to invite you to share it with your family and friends. We'll see you next week.